Welcome back to the podcast. Hey, before we get into it today, if you're listening to the podcast when it comes out, I wanted to let you know that on Tuesday, April 11th, I'm hosting a Channeling Wealth Consciousness Master Class. And you can get your ticket at the link in the show notes. But basically what we're going to be talking about that day is I'm going to be teaching you about the streams of wealth consciousness that you're meant to be channeling right now for infinite prosperity. Wealth consciousness runs on streams of peace and beauty, radiance, joy, wisdom, confidence, and even money itself. So I would love for you to join us and um, you're going to discover some of the common barriers and blocks to channeling wealth consciousness, plus the best practices to attract, receive, and hold wealth, including financial wealth for now and in the future. And you're also going to receive a potent channeled wealth consciousness activation that promises to shift your perspective on money and wealth in ways that are even better than you could have hoped for or imagined. So if that sounds like your jam, join us. Just hit the link below in the show notes and we will see you on April 11th. And now on with the show. So has anybody been having weird dreams lately? I know I have, and I know a lot of my clients have, and that's one of the reasons that I felt called to do this, this particular episode today, which is all about dreams and the ascension process. So let me back up a second. Freud called dreams the road to the, the royal road to the unconscious. Carl Jung, who's my really my favorite of all of the early psychologists, would say that dreams allow access to our unconscious minds, that it's not just, I think Freud would probably say that everything is psychosexual, so everything in the dream represents some kind of repressed sexual desire or uh, wish fulfillment, really, is what Freud talked a lot about. And Jung said something a little bit more broad than that. He just said that everything in dreams is symbol symbolized in the unconscious, something that the, the patient or the, the individual would want to do to be or to have. And um, so I think those are two pretty interesting perspectives on dreams. I have my PhD in psychology, as you know, when I in my training as a psychologist, we did spend quite a bit of time on dreams and dream interpretation, which was actually pretty unusual at the time. And because I was going to school to get my PhD in the early 2000s, from 2002 to 2008, we'd kind of moved past the real psychoanalytic and psychodynamic perspectives on any kind of behavior change. And, you know, cognitive behavioral therapy was a pretty big deal. Narrative therapy was coming onto the, onto the scene as something that seemed to be very important. And of course, evidence-based practices were very important as well. And dream interpretation is one of those, one of those arts, I'll say, that doesn't have a lot of science-based backing to it. And certainly, as I've been on this ascension journey for the last several years, what I've come to realize about dreams is it is more than just our unconscious desires, our wish fulfillments, our psychosexual desires. There's so much more to dreams than that. But I do remember early, early on in my awakening process, years and years ago, even before I started my PhD, I had some big dreams, some significant dreams that really helped to point the way to where I was meant to be. Uh, When I talk about teaching the Akashic Records, learning the Akashic Records, actually, one of my first activations with the Akashic Records came in probably 2001, maybe 2002. I didn't know what it was at the time. I just knew that there was this big gold wheel with hieroglyphs. At least that's what I thought they were. were It was some kind of writing that that I didn't understand on a conscious level, but certainly my soul did. And um, that activated something in me, that dream, as I watched that gold disc spin and spin and spin, and the the, uh, images come flying off of it, activated something in me that my guides would tell me years later that was actually the Akashic Records. And I remember having another dream early on in my awakening process when, I was going through a divorce from my college sweetheart and my mom was just beside herself. 
she was angry with me. She was angry at my dad because of course, if my dad hadn't left her, probably I wouldn't have that generational trauma and maybe I would have stayed with my ex-husband, which I very much doubt, but you know, she was just, she was doing the best that she could. And we have since resolved that. But at the time it was a pretty intense experience that I had with my mother. And, um, and what I've come to realize about that dream, which I'll share with you in just a second, is it really did, it, it was kind of a commentary on what was going on between me and my mom at the time. So in my dream, my mom and I were at Disneyland and we were waiting to go on this amazing new ride called Minnie Mouse and the Nile River. And it was literally Minnie Mouse as the Sphinx with a, like on her underbelly, a boat that was, it was supposed to be a river ride, right? You get on the boat and you go on the river around on the Nile. And the theme music for this dream was Denial Ain't a River in Africa. Denial Ain't a River in Africa. As it turns out in my dream, the, the um, ride was closed that day. There was no river. There was no river. There was no water flowing through it. So I wasn't able to actually go on that ride with my mother in my dream. And from there, I woke up. Well, let me just suffice to say this. There was a whole lot of unpacking that had to happen around that dream. And the reason I share this with you is because I think it's so important to just kind of look back at those big dreams that we have to understand. I mean, that was a really obvious one, right? Denial ain't a river in, in Africa. Well, you're right. It's not. And there was a lot of commentary that I had with my therapist at the time about, you know, what that dream actually meant to me and how that played out in my relationship with my mother. And there's all sorts of sim symbols and imagery and, stories that can go along with that. So maybe you've had a big dream like that. And if you have, I would invite you to take a look at that dream. More recently, though, especially in the past couple of years, as we've gone through this great awakening process, my dreams have become different, way different than they were when I was first awakening, for sure. And even though I learned how to interpret dreams during my, during my PhD program, and my favorite method of dream interpretation actually doesn't come from Freud or Carl Jung. It actually comes from Fritz Perls, who's the, the uh, founder or the originator of Gestalt therapy. And what Fritz Perls says about dream interpretation is this, is that nobody, first of all, nobody can interpret the dream except the dreamer, because every aspect of the dream is an aspect of the dreamer. So you can literally in the Gestalt method of dream interpretation, you can literally pick every salient experience, every salient symbol from that dream and tell the story of the dream from that item's perspective. So to go back to my Minnie Mouse on the Nile Disney dream with my mother, if every part of the dream is part of me, then I could tell the story from the ride itself, the Minnie Mouse as Sphinx with no water flowing through it. I could tell it from that perspective. Then I could tell it from the perspective of the dry river riverbed. Then I could tell it from the perspective of the boat. Then I could tell it from my mother's perspective. Then I could tell it from my perspective. Then I could tell it from the song's perspective. Do you see what I'm saying? Like there's so many layers of this, but the key to it is that only the dreamer can interpret the dream. And I learned this again in a different perspective from one of my teachers in grad school. When I would come to her with a dream, which I often did, because I had a lot of dreams back then, especially what I considered big dreams. I kind of made everything a spiritual experience, whether it was or not is another thing entirely, but I certainly would try to make them spiritual experiences. And I would go to her and I'd say, I had this dream. And she would say to me, okay. You had this dream. She said, well, I can't interpret it for you. But she would then say, if it were my dream, this is how I would think about it. And then she would proceed to process through the dream from her perspective, 
saying, if it were my dream, but it's not my dream. And then she would hand it back to me and she would say, okay, now you take it from your perspective, since it's your dream, how do you understand this? And I think that there's such a gift in understanding our dreams. And there's, there's a gift in interpreting them and, and getting a deeper, having a deeper understanding and relationship to them. But here's the thing that I've noticed in the past few years. In the past few years, during this great awakening process, in this ascension process, what I've come to realize is that dreams are not just symbols from my personal unconscious. The dreams that I have are not just from me. What I have come to realize, and are you ready for this plot twist? Because you may not see where this is going. What I've come to realize is that there are some aspects of our sleep state that where our, our consciousness is actually hijacked by beings, malevolent beings who have, who are using our consciousness to do a lot of different things. In fact, there are three different main different ways that our consciousness can get hijacked at night in our sleep. So our bodies can be laying down resting, but our consciousness travels. And we know this is called astral travel too, but in these cases where your consciousness is actually hijacked, this is what I want to talk about today. So there are three major places that when your consciousness is, is hijacked that you're going to go. You're either going to go to work, like go to work in the salt mines in another dimension. You're going to go to war in another dimension, or you're going to go into sex work or sex slavery. And the reason that I bring this up specifically is because I've had a couple of clients and friends actually recently, and myself too, to be honest, who have had these experiences where I wake up in the morning and I'm exhausted, they'll say, or they'll say, I had this really weird dream where I was having intercourse with somebody who I'd never met before, and I was doing things that I would never actually do. Or I had a dream that I went to war and I was blowing people up. And it's all under the guise, under the assumption that I'm just dreaming it. And I have to tell you, as much as I like Carl Jung, I have this, this really quite profound suspicion that he was part of the problem. At least he wasn't telling the whole truth. Because as I said, Dreams are not just part of our personal unconscious. There's a whole lot more going on in the nighttime space, in the sleep space than what we've been led to believe. And so when I talk to my clients about their dreams, I'm using discernment to help them decide what was that exactly? Was that my personal experience? Was that my personal unconscious back in the Minnie Mouse on the Nile dream that I had that I described earlier? Was that my personal experience? Probably. It made a whole lot of sense in terms of helping me understand my relationship with my mother and what was going on with me. And it was quite funny, actually, especially with the soundtrack that was going on. So I was actually able to process some unconscious information that had been kind of sitting there latent in my system that I wasn't aware of until that dream came forward. So I was grateful for that. But I use my discernment to figure that out. These other weird dreams where you're having about going to work somewhere else or um, having these weird experiences with other people or going to war, those are the ones that are more concerning to me. And here's why, especially for people who are awake, who are on the ascension path, we can sometimes make the assumption that it's just us, that there's nothing actually going on except what's in our imagination, that it's all in our heads except what if it isn't, except if you have the capacity to do, all, to do astral travel, for example, if, if telepathy is real, which I know that it is, if we have the ability to travel, our consciousness has the ability to travel during dream time, during sleep time, then isn't it also possible that there are other dimensions that we might travel to? And if that is so, 
then we have what I believe is a responsibility to ourselves, to our physical bodies and to our souls to be very protective of our sleep state. And let me tell you, so there are a couple of things. One is that my husband and I moved into a new home about a year ago, a little over a year ago. It had been a rental for about 15 years and we did kind of not a complete overhaul on it, but we changed some things up. I could still feel that the energy was pretty fractured in it. And when I first moved into this house, I kept on having dreams, what I thought were dreams. And it turns out I was just witnessing other dimensions playing out. But I kept on having dreams about people being in the house, people hiding in the rafters, people hiding in cabinets. And I, I knew that there was something going on in the house. I could feel the kind of fractured energy. I could feel the, the, um, the dissonance, I'll call it, the, the displaced souls probably that were here. It wasn't that old of a house, but when, you, when it's a rental for as many years it, as it was, there's quite a big possibility that there were some nefarious things going on here. And in fact, that's as I tuned into the Akashic Records and I worked with a couple of my colleagues who do Akashic Records work too, that's exactly what we found out. But the thing that sealed the deal for me on these other dimensions being present and being being aware of those other dimensions in my dream state was that my husband woke up one morning and he said, I dreamed that there was a kid in one of the one of our cabinets hiding away, like a stowaway. And I was like, I kind of sat back and I was like, okay, that was my signal that something needed to shift. And we did a whole energy clearing and transformation on this property, a reclamation of the property and a, um, a releasing of all displaced souls from it. We meaning me and some of my colleagues supported me in that. So I'm sharing this with you for a couple of reasons. It's becoming more prominent in my experience with people who are awake who are on the ascension path and who are very, very open to new experiences. Remember I give the Neo personality profile and the hallmark of the creative personality. And what I believe is the hallmark of the spiritually intelligent personality is to have a profound openness to new experiences, being able to um, tap in and have a very active imagination, right? Being able to see beyond being very tuned into your intuition. That's one of the keys to the spiritual intelligence piece of the puzzle. And what I've been doing with my clients is equipping them with some tools to support them as they are discerning what kind of dream was this? Was it actually a dream or was my consciousness hijacked? Was it taken against my will to another dimension to work, to go to war, to have sex with creepy people? I don't know. What was it? Was that an was that the royal road to my unconscious? Was that one of my wish fulfillments was to go do these things? Chances are quite good, no. So in the spirit of restoring our free will, in the spirit of restoring our personal sovereignty, in the spirit of restoring our connection with infinite possibilities, the things that I've been teaching my clients about are how to how to discern what kind of experience they had during their, their nighttime state actually was, and then to create some practices that are going to be supportive of fortifying their sleep space so that they can get a really good sleep at night. Because here's the thing, when your consciousness is off doing something else at night, whether it's of your free will or not, you're going to wake up exhausted. You're going to wake up sh scattered. You're going to wake up feeling grumpy and crunchy and irritable, which makes for a very difficult day. And it makes it very difficult to channel wealth consciousness when you're not feeling your best. And sleep, as you know, is a, an essential aspect of health and well-being. Whether you're going to channel or not, it's really important that you feel your best. But when you're waking up on edge every single morning, I can guarantee that you're not feeling your best. And so that it becomes more difficult to, to attract, receive, and hold the wealth that you're wanting to channel through you. So let's talk about 
some of the practices that I recommend my clients put into place and maybe they'll be beneficial for you as well. One is I always clear my bedroom. I smudge it. I have crystals in it, in and around my bed. I use rose quartz under my, the pedestals of my bed. And listen, I studied Reiki years ago. I'm old school. I'll use my Reiki symbols and draw big Reiki symbols on all of the walls, on the bed. And I call in the Archangel Michael and I ask the Archangel Michael and his legion of, of warrior angels to surround and protect my space. I also have the Syrian Brotherhood who I have come to find out these beings are, they're actually, they remind me of the Teenage Mutant Ninja Turtles, like good reptilians who are here as protectors, benevolent protectors of me and of the people who know about them. So I ask them to come in too and just protect my space. I create a Merkaba. A Merkaba is actually two pyramids. One is right side up and the other is upside down and they intersect. If you don't know what that looks like, you can go online and, and Google what is a Merkaba. But here's what I do. As I envision the Merkaba, I envision it dropping onto my home, my whole home, from property line to property line. And I will, in my mind's eye, bring in a beautiful violet flame into the center of the home. And the violet flame is very purifying. And I just intend that the violet flame sweeps throughout the entire Merkaba, which covers my whole property. And then in my mind's eye, I will spin the top pyramid and then I will spin the bottom pyramid. So both are spinning. So these are some of the energetic protections that I put around my home and my bedroom in order to make sure that only the purest love, light, and truth can penetrate. And that I have a clear space to be able to sleep and dream in. So that's number one. Number two, I also clear my own field. So I cut cords. And if you're watching the video, you can see me. I'm just moving my hands down my field and just cutting cords front and back, side to side, making sure that my field is clear as well. I wash my hands. I wash my face. And always with the intention of cleaning and purifying my field so that I am fully safe and protected to dream well. So there are some other things that I do as well, but those are the major ones that I would invite you to consider looking into if this is something that lands for you. If it's not, that's cool too. It's a perspective that we have. The guides have been animate. In fact, at 3 a.m. in the morning, they've come to me the last couple of mornings and said, you have to do this podcast. This is very important. And I say back to them at 3 a.m. in the morning, I'm not podcasting at 3 a.m. in the morning. So here I am today sharing this information with you. And let me just see if there's anything else that they want me to add about dream time. I would, here's the last thing is that they want to come back to discernment. Not everybody is going to have their consciousness hijacked. But those of us who do or who have that experience really need to learn how to call back all aspects of ourselves to ourselves, to our, to our physical bodies, from all other dimensions, spaces, times, levels of consciousness and beyond. And then we also have to learn how to seal the portals so that they cannot be opened again. And I'll end with this story just to illustrate what I'm talking about here with portals. Uh, this is about six months ago. You know, I have Cooper, my golden doodle. He's now just turned two. So he was about a year and a half. And he's a bold, confident dog. Like, he's a little skittish with, like, thunder and lightning. But for the most part, he's pretty outgoing. And there was one day in last November or so that he, my husband came home with a Christmas decoration. My husband loves decorating for Christmas. And he can't, like, it's never too early to start decorating for Christmas as far as he's concerned. And he brought home this angel, this like three foot tall angel. And he put it in the, the alcove right outside of our bedroom, uh, made in China, whatever. And he was planning on placing it sometime, you know, after Thanksgiving, 
but he brought it home, put it in the alcove just to leave it there until he could put it away in the closet until he was ready to use it. Anyway, Cooper came around the corner, saw the angel and freaked out. Like I've never seen the dog. He was freaked out. But that angel created a trigger response in Cooper. And for the next week or so, he was like, he wouldn't leave my side. He was scared of his own shadow. And I was trying to figure out what was going on with him. What, you know, what was going on? It was clearly, it felt very supernatural to me. It didn't feel like a stress response. It felt weird and creepy. And that's how I know for me anyway, it's supernatural. So um, I consulted some of my Akashic Record teachers, friends, and we were talking about it. And one of them suggested that maybe there was a portal that had been opened to another dimension. Well, I thought about that and I went and I took a nap and Cooper would not leave my side. So he was laying on the bed with me. And as I'm in my, my hypnagogic state, it's that dream state. I wasn't asleep. Like I was aware, but I was also in a relaxed, open state. So as, as I'm in this, this state, this being with all, all dressed in white, like a, a clean suit from like a lab and a mask, white mask came and stood in my room. At the same time I saw him, Cooper began barking like he saw this person too. And it was then that I knew that I had a portal open to somewhere. I think it was China. Who knows? Uh, who knows for sure? But um, that was my signal that I had to close the portal and clean the space. Right. And as soon as I did that, within a day or so, Cooper recovered from this profound anxiety that he had been experiencing. It's a pretty interesting story. So I just share this with you to help you start differentiating. Are there other dimensions that I'm kind of floating off to and or being taken to to work or to go to war? Um, are these portals and do they need to be closed? And if they need to be closed, then it's time to learn how to close them. And that's something that I can help with. So with that, I'm going to close today. So I'm going to just invite you to breathe in love and grace and breathe out everything that doesn't serve. It's been my joy to be here on this podcast with you today. And as always, if you're somebody who is intelligent and intuitive and you know it's probably time for us to work together, you can start that process just by booking a private consult with me. Go to drrobinmckay.com forward slash call. That gets you on my calendar. We'll have a conversation about the best approach to working together on stuff like this and becoming the channel for wealth consciousness as well. All right. Until next time. See you later.